I was born in Uganda and I went to the Aga Khan school in Kampala and then went to the University of Nairobi in Kenya and did my engineering. And at the age of 23, I got my first degree, which is bachelor's in engineering science, mechanical engineering. And I came back from Nairobi to Kampala just to learn that uh, we had to leave. So it was well within a few months of my coming back as a graduate that I heard, well, this famous announcement in August of 1972, they had this verification whereby all people born in Uganda uh, had to verify the documents to say that they were Ugandan citizens. And then they would be given an identity card. This was again part of Idi Amin's uh, ruling that those who were born here will be given an ID card so that you can stay, others will have to go. But when I went in the queue and I presented my birth certificate, I presented my uh, passport, and the lady who was looking at it said, did you renounce the British allegiance when you turned 21? And, and I said, yes, I did, except that you don't get any, the process wasn't that you get a, a, an acknowledgement or anything like that, but I had registered that particular thing. So I had a registered slip and everything. And she said, okay, I'll go and look at your file. And when she looked at the file, she said, it's not there. On that basis, and on that basis only, that I'd done the right thing, but on that basis, she said, give me your passport. And I thought she wanted to check something. And all she did was literally with a pair of scissors, cut the side and threw it in a heap. And with that, I became stateless. So stateless meant... I didn't have any country. Uh, and when I went to the British uh, High Commission, uh, they said, you had renounced your, you, you just told us you had renounced your allegiance and your parents were born, although in, born in India, uh, you were born in, in, in Uganda, so you don't qualify. Same with India, same with Pakistan, same with every other country except Canada and then Australia. There was an impact on several members of our family of this expulsion. My parents, Gulamali and Janabai Nanji, had migrated from Gujarat in 1928 and brought up 11 children, all of us born in Uganda. In July of 1972, my father and mother came to London to visit my brother Ramzan and my sister-in-law, Roshan. Hence, when the announcement was made in August of 1972, they were still in London. They never returned to Uganda. They settled down in Islington, near where my brother lived. Incidentally, my brother Ramzan had served in the British Army prior to starting his own business. He is presently retired and enjoying life with his family in London. My sister Mary Mohammed had the most unfortunate situation when in July of 1972, she had come to visit us in Kampala from Nairobi with her son Karim aged nine years, and her daughter, Shalina, who was only three years old. When the infamous announcement was made in August, we organized for Mary, Karim, and Shalina to fly back to Nairobi. They were not allowed to enter Kenya to be with my brother-in-law, Fateli Mohammed, since my sister was born in Uganda. So they put her on the plane back to Uganda. And I went to the airport not knowing what was going on, whether she was coming back and we didn't know what was going on. The next thing I know is they put her on a flight to London. Now she had only come for a holiday. Can you imagine coming for a holiday with two kids 
and just bringing holiday clothes and all that and now ending up in London um, in, in, in uh, September. And uh, it, it was still quite cold or no, not cold, but quite different, I guess. And, but fortunately she was allowed to stay on the basis that my brother lives here and that my parents were also here. And on that basis on humanitarian grounds, the British government uh, allowed her to stay and she's well settled now uh, and lives in Herringay in North London. There were quite a few people who were not accepted by any country. Just before the deadline, uh, the United Nations, UNHCR actually, uh, just sent planes and just loaded the planes and people didn't know where they were going to end up and ended up in various camps in Malta, in Italy and in various other parts of Europe. And, uh, and that was just because Idi Amin had implied that whoever stays back and doesn't have that ID card uh, he said, I don't know what I'll do, but I was in favor of uh, what Hitler did. As the deadline was approaching, another member of our family, my brother Rajabali Nanji, who lives with my sister-in-law Amir Banu in London, played an extraordinary role by assisting people who had no documentation whatsoever with temporary UNHCR and Red Cross travel documents. He had sent his family to Kenya, where with the help of Sir Ibu Pirbai, the family was allowed to stay in Kenya. And his family, after the deadline, ended up in England at the camp at RAF West Malling in Kent, where he served as the chairman of the Asian Committee of Uganda Resettlement Board and as Mukhi of the Ismaili Jamaat in the camp. He once again assisted numerous families in the camp to resettle in other countries all over the world. Rajabali and Amir Banu and their children plays Shenas and Minas, together with their respective families, are presently very well settled in the UK and in France. When I became stateless, I felt devastated because I didn't know at that age what, what was in store, store for me. I've got another brother who said, okay, wherever you go, I'll go with you so that at least uh, we, we are together. And then we started just saying, okay, we have to go and find a country. So every embassy you can think of and every queue there was, we would stand in that queue because um, that, 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 was, that, that became our life. We were getting acceptance by Canada because Canada was not as selective. They were looking at humanitarian cases. They were looking at all that. But there were three conditions. They were, my qualifications from the University of Nairobi would not be recognized. I didn't have a travel document. And the third and most important, I was engaged. And the Canadian um, requirement was that I had to get married if she was to come with me. She did not, my, my wife, who became my wife, uh, did not qualify to go with her family because she was over 18. She was the eldest daughter. So that's why the family thought that since we were engaged, she could come with me. But Canada said no, because we have to get married. So by coincidence, I found out that Australia, um, I applied and, and it was absolutely sheer luck that the Australian High Commissioner, uh, the attache had come to Kampala. He was based in Nairobi, but had come to Kampala and he was in a hotel. I gave him my application. And I said, you can call me for an interview. And he said, sit down, this is your interview. And um, he asked me the first question, which was, um, what, what's your qualification? And I said, quite proudly, I just graduated. I said, mechanical engineer. <laughs> and he uh, shook his head and he said, Australia is full of mechanical engineers. <laughs> that was so disappointing. And I was saying, uh-oh, Canada it is, or something like that. 
the next question that he asked me was the reason why I got I went to uh, Australia, and that question was, "What do you do now?" And I said, "I've just graduated. I'm looking for a job in that particular area, but I'm lecturing at the Uganda Technical College in engineering." And he said, "Aha." you're not a mechanical engineer, you're a lecturer. In his list, lecturer was there. So he said, here are your visas. So I said, my brother wants to come with me. And he says, what's his qualification? I said, electrical engineer. He says, does he teach? I said, part-time. He says, oh, we'll make that full-time. So he was so kind. <laughs> he, he, he is the angel in all this. And then not only from my point of view, all the people who I talk to who have come to Australia, this particular person, his name is John Paddock. He deserves the highest of the praise because he was really concerned, really kind-hearted, and, and really made it possible to, for, for people like us to, to go to Australia. And the third question was to him that, look, I'm engaged and I'd like my fiance to come with me. And, and she said, not a problem. And I said, I don't have a travel document. He says, we will give you a one-way travel document. So that's why I'm saying it was fate. On the way to the airport, we were, the family had to say goodbye to us at Kampala, not at Ndebe, which is about 25, 21 miles away. So we were the only three at the airport after about 10 o'clock. And an army person comes to me. The, this is Idi Amin, one of his persons, uh, army official and tells me that uh, I think your luggage is, is quite, you've got a lot of luggage. I, I can put it through if you like. So I was, again, as a, as a 23 year old, I was in a bit of a dilemma because if I gave him some whatever bribe or anything, I could be you know, charged and nobody would know and, and, and all that sort of thing. So uh, all I did was just shake my head and say, yep, and, and for sure, he, he put the luggage through, didn't have any questions on that. And then he went on the other side of the, uh, of the counter when we were right in, uh, he said, oh, the bathroom is over there. <laughs> so I, I knew what that meant, that he wanted his bride. So I put a hundred shillings note on my top pocket and I went in the bathroom and he brushed past me and took the hundred shillings note. So logically or whichever way I, I at least satisfied myself that I hadn't given it to him he had taken it so in case there was anything but that that, that was the, the the last of the experience so and then when we landed in Sydney uh, yes it was the first time coming into a, a western country but the first experience was that at the airport uh, we had all these people come to receive us which was incredible because again, what had happened was a week before, the same person who had told me about Australia, his name is Ashok Mehta. He and his wife had arrived a week earlier and nobody had gone to, to, to look after them, except for a, t a TV crew, the ABC in, in Australia. And the ABC actually took them to a hostel and, and they did a, uh, um, a, a particular interview which was on air and that meant that uh, you know when we arrived because there was a lot of publicity as a result of the first arrival we were treated like royalties and there was all the press and everybody outside to to greet us literally my brother and myself his name is Shiraz Shiraz and myself were interviewed uh, and there were all sorts of questions asked bearing in mind that Australia had just uh, abolished the white Australia policy in 1971. And we were there in 1972 as the first batch of non-Europeans. When we got to the hostel, the uh, hostel manager, and he told this lady from the Australian Council of Churches who had taken us there to say, there is a mistake. This hostel is reserved for British migrants. He was like saying, do you understand? That's it. You know, we can't bring anybody else over here. And this lady said, these are my instructions. Thank you very much. She turned around and she went and we were left with Mr. Alman, who took us to a room, you know, all that sort of thing. 
And he said, as he was leaving, he said, and I hope you leave the room clean. Pleased to say two weeks later, the same person had become our friend because he saw we could speak English. He's he actually, my brother also fixed some of the table lamps for him for nothing at the hostel and all that sort of thing, for no charge. And, and hence he became a friend. And as we were leaving, he said goodbye and all that. And he said, I hope you left the room clean. And I said, yes, cleaner than we found it. Other benefits, not benefits, but a consequence, I should say, of us being put in a hostel was that the Australian Council of Churches looked at it and said, hey, everybody's going to have this sort of problem. So they approached the government and the government agreed to have non-Europeans at the various hostels. And that was the first time in, in uh, after the 1971 and in, in 1972 that they made it open. So there were all subsequent arrivals from Uganda came into, and, and they had actually a government car pick them up and take them to the hostel. So I think that was, again, a, a blessing for so many people because the stories that uh, have come through after that were all very, very appreciative of the fact that the Australian Council of Churches did such a wonderful job. I'd landed with 20 cents in my pocket. My fiance had some, but just a bit of travel allowance and, and my brother had some, but again, travel allowance. So I, I'm, I'm in fact, sometimes I, I think about it to say, what would have happened if nobody had come to pick us up? Where would we have gone? We, we had no idea. Although the Australian embassy had uh, told us that, you know, things will be organized, but we weren't sure, like, like what happened with Ashok Mehta, that you know, they, they ended up uh, take, being taken to a hostel. But anyway, we, so talking about the finances, the next day, so we arrived on the 10th of October, 1972 in Sydney. On the 11th of October, Australian Council of Churches took us, me and Shiraz, to have our qualifications assessed and all that. So it took us to the Institution of Engineers. They took my fiance to look for a job. Now she was in a final year at the university in uh, Kampala, Makerere University, and she hadn't completed her Bachelor of Arts, but she was very good in English, very good in writing and all that. And she got a job, like on Thursday, she could start on the Thursday. We landed on the Tuesday and she started work on the Thursday. And my famous line became from my fiance, she became my finance. So, <laughs> and she was getting, $50 a week. With the $50, we had moved into a house within the two weeks. We paid rent $30. All the food, everything, we was costing us $10 for the three of us. And we could save $10. So in that way, we started to become uh, a bit self-sufficient, but then we also qualified for unemployment, which a new government had come in and they had said, well, uh, you are entitled to this. So I was getting something like $35 and, and Shiraz was getting something like $35 as well. So that built up our capital a little bit. And eventually we bought a, car, a small mini minor car and all that sort of again in the British tradition. Like with all new migrants, even today, when looking for a job in a new country, the excuse that a company frequently uses to reject your application is that you do not have local experience. Well, I went through that, uh, those sorts of scenarios and eventually ended up working as a consulting engineer with an international firm, Norman Disney and Young NDY for 33 years. I retired in 2011 and was given a Maharaja's farewell. I feel very fortunate. In 2012, I joined the University of Sydney where I was instrumental in the design of the first ever indoor environment quality, IEQ laboratory in Australia 
where comfort-related studies are being carried out. I was also fortunate to have been able to contribute to the development of a new degree, Masters of Architectural Science, High Performance Building, which has turned out to be a very popular choice for many local and international students. Shamim and I had met at the Aga Khan High School in Kampala in 1969. We got married in Vancouver in 1974. We have two children, son Amin, married to Zara, and they have Zain, Kian, and Aiden as their sons, and Rahana married to Andrew Wheel, and they have Azra and Nala Shamim. In 2017, my dear wife Shamim tragically succumbed to the insidious motor neuron disease, MND, also known as ALS. MND uh, destroys the nerve cells, namely neurons that control the muscles that enable us to move, speak, swallow, and indeed breathe. Whilst MND has been uh, recognized some 150 years ago, is still no cure, and the only medical treatment that Shamim received was Reluzo, to be taken twice a day in a tablet form, which was supposed to extend her life by two months. Sadly, she departed this world on the 2nd of November, 2019. Her contributions to early childhood development and her work in assisting migrants settle in Australia are legacies left behind together with her fabulous paintings. Pray her soul continues to rest in eternal peace. Uh, just recently uh, at the Australian Maritime Museum, uh, they have got a submarine, which is um, where uh, children and you know people can go and have a look at the submarine, it's part of a tour. But in summertime, when our temperatures go up over 30 degrees quite regularly, the submarine temperatures inside were ranging from 35 to 40 degrees, and they would stop all the uh, tours. And this was during the summer holidays, school holidays, and the children were you know, deprived of a, a tour and learning. So my profession is mechanical engineering, so I offered to them to say, I'll design an air conditioning system for the submarine which I did, it's all done. And my son and my daughter paid the money to have it installed as dedication to their mom and my wife. Shamim was an integral part of my research related to architectural science, including cooling and heating systems in commercial buildings and their impact on climate change and on COVID. Her dedicated contributions to this vital topic provided the motivation and combined with encouragement from my son Amin and my daughter Rohana, I was able to recontinue my studies in 2021. I'm humbled to say that in March of this year, I successfully defended my Doctor of Philosophy, my PhD. This means that I have now joined a very select group of senior persons in age who have been awarded PhDs in the School of Architecture, Design and Planning at the University of Sydney. Um, a tribute that the Australian uh, Maritime Museum has paid, as well as the air conditioning industry, where they have not only acknowledged that it's quite unique to have air conditioning of a submarine, I'm building it's okay, but the air conditioning of a submarine, and I made it also uh, COVID safe by using the right type of filters, the amount of ventilation and everything, because we had done a lot of studies as part of my, my um, uh, PhD as well. So this design was an extension of, 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 of my th thesis, if you like, 
And they're going to put a plaque for uh, my wife, uh, Shamim, and uh, a dedication to say, because she always used to say, and that's the, what the plaque is going to read, that children learn by experience. 2022 also marks the 50 years of the establishment of the Ismaili community in Australia and New Zealand. Shamim, Shiraz, and I were fortunate to have had the very first gathering of the Ismailis in Australia at our home in Sydney on 13th December 1972. I'd also had the opportunity to serve as Mukhi for several years and held a position equivalent to the President of the Council of Australia and New Zealand until 1987. We were instrumental in development of Jamaat Khanna's with early childhood learning facilities in each of the major cities in Australia and New Zealand. We felt blessed that we had the opportunity to organize the visits by His Highness the Aga Khan to Australia in 1979 and then again in 1987 when he arrived on the 1st of January. The Australian National Maritime Museum has a welcome wall, which last year became the National Migration Monument. We feel humbled that our family name has been inscribed as migrants from Uganda. I was fortunate to have been named in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in 2017 and received an AM as a member of the Order of Australia for my services to the Ismaili community in Australia, for sustainability at tertiary level, and for engineering. Whilst it wasn't war per se that made us leave, it was very similar circumstance that you didn't know what was going on. And particularly in my case, where we had just had to leave because there was no other choice. And leaving with virtually the clothes that you wear and not knowing what the future is going to be is something that I can relate to so many people now leaving Ukraine and literally not, not, not knowing what's going on, what's going to happen to them what their life ends up. The parallel to that is that, yes, the world, in this case, in Ukraine's case, at least there's a lot more support. I'm afraid to say during the Uganda crisis, uh, right when it happened, the world didn't sort of, you know, come to the help of people. Only individual countries like Canada and the UK and all that, but... I remember even as a, as a young person questioning that to say, isn't there a responsibility of you know, somebody to say, hey, you know, what he's doing is wrong, but it was regarded as, oh, we do not interfere with internal matters. This is an internal matter. It wasn't an internal matter. It, has, it had ramifications as we know now on what happened in, to so many people, well, 50 or 60,000 people who had to leave by that time and, and hence. So again, going back to the Ukraine situation, although it's war-torn now and, and, and there are very, very sad stories, the, uh, at least there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel where you do have support from the world and, and uh, there are various organizations and various charities particularly and countries helping out. We've got uh, migrants coming into Australia, migrants going to Canada, and again, the uh, local support by not just government officials, but individuals has been extraordinary.